Well, welcome everyone and thank you Netta for inviting us to speak on this important topic and that's the inspection of elevated structures, otherwise known as the balcony bill. So what we're gonna do is allow each of the speakers to introduce themselves and we're going to start with Robert. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Robert Gross. I'm with Bergman Group. I'm the Southern California General Manager. We are a construction management company. My background is architecture, but our focus and our business model is built around HOA communities. Uh, and we service HOA communities needs from repiping, re-roofing, all of the type of improvement needs that HOAs have. Um, but right now, today, we're talking about SB 326 and the physical aspects of complying with the regulation and getting it signed off. Okay, and Sean, if you'll introduce yourself. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sean Cargari. I'm the president of Association Reserves Los Angeles office. I have uh, 17 years of reserve study experience, and I've completed over 3,000 reserve studies for HOAs, timeshares, and municipalities across the United States, and as well as international locations. Thank you, Sean. And I'm Adrian Adams, and most people know me through my website and newsletter, the uh, davissterling.com website, which is a research website used by the industry on all things related to uh, homeowner associations, common interest developments in California. And uh, we're pleased to be with you today to, to, to talk about this uh, subject. So let's get started. Okay, what caused the legislature to um, bring about SB 326? Uh, there were a couple of incidents, both that involved in tragedy, uh, and that was the collapse of wooden balconies. One in Malibu in 1992, uh, where partiers uh, on a balcony fell 20 feet below to the rocks and surf and uh, rescue efforts, which were hampered, and they had 35 paramedics responding to uh, people who had been washed into the surf off the rocks, and they treated concussions, broken bones, and other injuries. There was discussions at that time of creating some kind of balcony bill, but nothing ever came of it. And then uh, there was a second incident in Berkeley in 2015, where a balcony collapsed. As you can see, there were 13 individuals, there were students uh, on that balcony, and the balcony swung down and pitched all 13 of them five stories to the street below. Six of them were killed and the other seven were injured. Uh, this is the remains of the balcony, and Robert, will you talk about what you see here? Yeah, this is actually the remains of the balcony that had that accident uh, that Gaza Newsom and others took action on. This uh, shows the decay of horizontal members, and understand this building is not that old. This is not an old building, um, but you can see the breakaway occurred uh, not at the point of connection, but w actually through the structural members themselves, and it uh, compelled the state and uh, uh, legislatures and other members um, in life safety issues to regulate and require inspection of these items. In fact, there was a bill submitted that was uh, quite draconian that um, went through the legislature and was defeated. And then the following year, last year, CAI introduced their own bill to deal with balcony inspections, it was a little bit more reasonable in their approach on how to handle them. And it deals with all exterior structural elements uh, that are involved with condominiums. So this is not planned developments, but condominiums only. So Robert, what is it that they're inspecting? The bill requires any life safety issue and structural issue of wood frame buildings more than six feet above grade to be inspected um, balconies, decks, elevated walkways, staircases, railings, anything exposed to weather, weather conditions that involve weatherproofing and wood structures that could cause injury to occupants or residents. Okay, and is this an example of the structures that would be inspected? Yeah, so in this case, you can see on the elevated building facades here, all these cantilevered um, balconies, if they're wood framed and if they're framed out of wood and, and built according, they would all require inspection or the components, including the railings, would have to be inspected uh, with a confidence factor specified in the bill. Okay, here's another example of balconies. And you can see these are recessed in. Uh, would these be required to be inspected under the bill? Now, since there's occupied space below these balconies, 
the decking area themselves does not need to comply to the regulation. But in our professional opinion, we would, in fact, look at the railings, make sure we include the railings in the inspection just to make sure they're safe. Okay, and Sean, from a reserve analyst point of view, what would you be looking at on these balconies? So we would definitely include the railings, as Robert indicated, for inspection. And then depending on the CCNRs, uh, we may also include the waterproofing of the decking membrane uh, for reserve funding. Okay, here's another with railings on uh, for each of these balconies, starting with the deck down below and then going up to each story. So the from the perspective of the bill, the 326, uh, Robert, is this something that would be inspected? Right, yes, uh, these would be inspected, the upper two stories, the second and third floor wood framed. Uh, please note that there is a roofing detail or element over the facade of the building. Um, that line is not considered um, in the framing of the building itself. These areas are to be inspected, even though there's a roof detail at the top or above it. Okay, and then as you can see, the question here is the HOA responsible for railings and the answer is yes. This is typical for all associations where the association is responsible and you can see where they've started painting them on the ground level and on the second story are still quite rusty and in need of painting. And uh, from a reserve analyst point of view, Sean, uh, would this be included in the reserve study? Absolutely. Uh, we include uh, funding for the decking inspection, the railing inspection, as well as uh, waterproofing based on the CCNRs. And 100% uh, of the time, we would include funding for repainting of the uh, wood and metal elements. If I could draw attention to these actually rails themselves, uh, in this image, you can see the, the, the rails are metal. Uh, since metal components are not covered under the bill, the railings themselves are not inspected under SB 326, but the connections to the wood framing it are. So when we say railings are included, in this case, the metal rails themselves, the connections to the wood members are in fact what would be inspected. Okay, and speaking of uh, railings, here we have them in elevated walkways. And so we have both railings and then the walkways themselves. Uh, and so Robert, what is it that you would be looking at from a 326 perspective? So again, the railings here, you can see actually in this photo, you can actually see the, the attachments to the wood framing. Those elements are required by this code to be inspected and make sure that they're safe and attached well. Um, the deck areas and the walkways, elevated walkways would require inspection. And in this photograph, you'll notice the hallways uh, at the right-hand side of the screen uh, show a hallway that kind of disappear into the mass or the body of the building. Uh, we would, upon physical inspection of the area, determine how far back into the building we'd inspect. It really is, you, you have to use common sense plus an extra few feet for safety factors of areas that water would intrude and possibly cause uh, damage to the wood structure. And so we would come up with a, you know, a reasonable dimension of how far back in the hallway we do inspect. Okay, and the next is uh, stairwells. So these are open, exposed stairwells. Uh, and you can see that these are, are into the wood. Is this something, uh, Robert, that would be included in your study and your report? This is a great photograph to look at because there's a couple of things going on. Number one is the stairs in this case are wood framed, wood members complete. These are not steel or metal or concrete step systems. These are all wood framed. So they fall under the code. But if you notice, the elevated elements, including the elevated uh, landing here, is at or below possibly six feet. So you could argue that the lower portion of the staircase is not in compliance of requirement for SB 326 safety inspection, but the fact that the upper stair portion transitions above six feet, you would argue and you would advise accordingly that the landing is to be inspected, even though it's not six feet because it supports an, a wood framed element that exceeds six feet in elevation. We'd also take a look at the railing at the top of this landing to make sure that it was detached safely. So again, this is a... Um, yeah, let me ask Sean, would that, is this something that you'd normally include in reserve studies as well? We, we do. We have to account for the waterproofing on the landings, the repainting of the metal railings, as well as the repainting of the wood stringers. So a lot of these items are already found on your reserve study and we'll be adding inspections as well. 
then how is the inspection of these elements different from a reserve perspective than uh, from an SB 326 perspective? Very good question. So as a reserve study provider, uh, we perform di diligent visual inspections, uh, but we never uh, conduct any destructive testing. And that's the key difference. Um, we are only able to inspect what is visible. Okay. Let's look at now metal uh, stairwells. And you can see that this is open to expose. You, if you look at the left side of the screen, you can see that it is open to the elements. So Robert, what would you be looking at here? And this is a good point. So uh, this area appears from this photograph to be an internal staircase, but the fact that it does not have windows or an enclosure, it allows weather and uh, possibly rain uh, to come in. It is an, an area that is required to be inspected. Uh, we have metal stairs with what appear to be concrete steps. Uh, those elements need not to be inspected but the attachments to the landing areas where it, we have and see wood framing and are in excess of six feet above grade um, are required to be inspected. And what we found traditionally is at these points of connection between these types of stairs, we do find in many buildings that this is a weak area in waterproofing in large part because water cascades down the stairs from a rain event and you have an unusual amount of water in some of these areas. So, um, Yes, we'd inspect those connection points very vigorously. And Sean, again, this is something that you would be looking at with paint and other surface or uh, exposed elements? Exactly, uh, but we would not be able to open up the walls and see the uh, critical juncture points as Robert pointed out. And let me draw attention to the railings real quick, if you could go back to that, Adrian. So the railings, there's points of connection with these metal rails onto the concrete, those areas need not be inspected. But any points of connection with this metal railing detail into wood members or structures, uh, we would take a look at those to make sure that they're uh, securely fastened. Thank you. Okay. All right, Sean, what kinds of things would be excluded? What are we not looking at for inspections? Sure, so other than decks that are within the building envelope, there are other types of decks that are excluded, and these include faux uh, balcony decks. Uh, these are excluded because the law mandates that the decks have to be for human occupancy, and faux decks are purely decorative. Uh, so you don't have to worry about th those decks shown here in the upper left. In the upper right photo, you can see a high-rise example uh, this is a reinforced concrete steel construction example, and uh, there is no wood involved here, uh, even though these decks do indeed have important waterproofing uh, concerns in regards to SB 326, uh, concrete and steel construction is not covered, so you don't have to worry about these decks. In the lower left corner, uh, we have an example of a rooftop deck. And since this deck is completely within the building envelope, meaning if there is a cave-in, it's going to go inside the room below, uh, you need not worry about the inspections. Um, however, I will remind you that waterproofing is extremely important for a deck such as this. And finally, uh, here on the bottom right corner is an example of a completely enclosed deck within the build building envelope. And I want to make the uh, distinction that any cantilever deck that has uh, a modified enclosure, usually installed by the individual owner, that deck would still need to be inspected. However, in this lower right photo, you can see as part of the original construction, this deck is totally within the building envelope and uh, need not be inspected. Okay, let's look at waterproofing. Uh, the statute does state in, in the, uh, the language of the statute itself that the part of the inspection is the waterproofing elements, the flashings, the membranes, coatings, and sealants. And then the question comes up is who's responsible for all of these sealants, especially in dealing with balconies? And I can tell you it's a constant problem that we deal with in that board members think the owners are responsible, the owners think that the association is responsible, and in reality, in most cases, it's the association. So unless the documents specifically state otherwise, uh, and this is also in addition to the Davis-Sterling Act, it states that balconies are exclusive use common area, and unless the CCNR state otherwise, owners are responsible for maintaining the balcony decks, but 
the association is responsible for repairing and replacing them. And so the question comes up, what's that mean, that the, the owners are responsible for maintaining them? And um, the consensus seems to be that they sweep them and keep them clean. Uh, when it comes time to repairing them, replacing those waterproofing elements, the association is going to be responsible unless the CCNR specifically state otherwise. Okay, so uh, Robert, tell us about the inspection process. How do you guys handle it? Uh, do you use an architect or a structural engineer? You know, uh, to all my f friends from architecture school, I, I, I have great respect for architects' ability to look at waterproofing, but the structural issues and the wood framed elements uh, in our firm, and we have structural engineers and architects in our firm, we only use structural engineers for this work. Uh, we do that because the uh, follow-up conversations and some of the issues that are confronted if problems are found are, are much easier addressed uh, with a structural engineer on hand. And also we like the final documentation and stamps on the final closeout documents to be from a California licensed structural engineer. Okay, and the whole point of the bill is to determine if these elevated structures are safe so that we don't have the problems of uh, balconies collapsing and people being injured or killed. So one of the things they're looking at is a significant st sample. And so from your perspective, what is a stati statistically significant sample? Since it says that you have to have 95% confidence, does that mean if you have 100 balconies, you have to inspect 95 of them? Not necessarily. Um, uh, you know, the 95% confidence factor is arguably the most confusing part of this regulation and causes the most uh, amount of conversation and concern by clients, uh, HOAs, property managers. How do we determine 95% confidence? Well, what we do uh, is we have a, a statistician has produced uh, a calculation formula for us. And um, the reason it's 95% confidence factor is it allows the structural engineer uh, and architects and other members of uh, uh, a knowledgeable set of people to look at a building and take common sense approach to some items. For example, if a building is built in 1968, uh, your confidence is different than if a building was built four years ago. Uh, if a building was built uh, in uh, Rancho Santa Margarita or an inland area that has dry conditions, it's different than coastal areas um, and uh, more wet uh, areas like Corona del Mar. Um, Santa Monica. Uh, so we take into account the physical conditions of the location, but we also look at which balconies face north or south, uh, exposure to sun, so that we can use good building knowledge and common sense to help define confidence. Um, but yet again, it's, it's, it's a complex conversation and decision to be made, and one that leads to a lot of concern by uh, HOA board members and property managers. We do everything we can to make sure we have the highest level of confidence. Um, so in some cases, the 95% confidence would be 95 decks. In some cases, it would be 60 some decks uh, out of 100, for example. Um, okay, well then the next question is going to be for a lot of boards is how do you go about doing the inspection itself? Robert? The first thing we do is we go out and we make a visual observation of the building to get some general information about its history and its condition. Um, once that's occurred, we engage a structural engineer, one of our team members, um, and we start talking about the different steps necessary to inspect the balcony, the materials it's made of, how, how to approach it, and we run kind of internally a 95% confidence factor um, statement internal. Um, we start with cutting open generally the underside of decks when they're cap when we're able to get access to them and most of them we are um, we open up a deck from below so we can inspect the lumber uh, and any intrusion of water that may be visible and this way we're not damaging the waterproofing from above um, we can and do use bore scopes uh, we have had engineers use a thermal uh, meter to understand moisture content in the wood itself uh, and we do advise a replacement of some of these openings that we cut with uh, with vents. And these small vents can be in the future removed and opened up to see inside uh, for future inspection. Therefore, you don't have to do destructive testing uh, in future dates. But also it allows the wood to uh, to breathe 
and moisture to vent out, which is the issue and cause a lot of this damage to begin with. So we do like the in inclusion and introduction of removable vents uh, in all of our projects. Okay, so is this an example of one of your projects? This is one of our projects. A uh, structural engineer went through and you can see a few photos here where they identified specific decks to be inspected. And you can see in this photo, one of four were to be inspected on this facade. Okay, and then what does this and, photo show? And on this facade, it shows 50% of those in the photo there in the center. As I recall on this building, based on the cumulative photos, I think we were to inspect on this building about 68% of all the balconies to maintain a 95% confidence factor. Okay, when you do these inspections, do you ever find problems with any of the decking? This is an example of problems we found, and this was not an SB326 inspection for photographs you see here. And this is work we've done. We were made aware that the uh, upper left-hand photo shows the railing connection on the deck, and it shows uh, some possible moisture issues um, with discoloration. Uh, when we started opening up this deck and these decks, we found uh, significant water damage uh, in the structural elements. The upper right-hand photo is actually the bolts, the connecting bolts of a cantilever deck onto the building itself. And I want to draw attention, this building is not 10 years old. So this damage was done within 10 years. Um, and uh, you know, they use this information to get the developer to respond. If you go to the next set of images, you got some more here. This is the same building. Uh, you can see the type of and level and how fast damage occurs when waterproofing is not correctly applied. In the upper left-hand photo, you'll see those wood uh, members. Those actually were shoring members put in place to maintain safety. Uh, we didn't want those decks to do anything other than stay in place until repairs could be made. Uh, so this is uh, an example of what the state and regulators are trying to avoid. Okay, and you said this project was less than 10 years old. Exactly, and that's important to say. Any properties that property managers or board members are affiliated with that are at or less than 10 years old um, should be inspected um, as quickly as possible. Uh, for the reason for that is there's a statute of limitations with uh, what developers are obligated to pay for, and um, it'd be a unfortunate to wait to do an inspection, an SB 326 inspection, only to find out you'd missed uh, the required timelines in order to hold the developer accountable. Okay, let's look at the process involved. Can you describe it, please? Our process, we have a, a two-step process. Uh, when I say a two-step process, that's the process that the, the board and the HOA and the property managers would see it as. The first step is the general engineering phase or step. In this step, we include our structural engineer would include a cost or fee uh, for the entire project, all the way through to the final documentation and paperwork. So it's a fixed fee amount. Um, in this step, an assessment would be made of the 95% confidence factor, and um, we would move into destructive testing. So if you go to the next slide, step two would be destructive testing. So step one, the HOA would approve the engineering, and step two, the HOA would approve the destructive testing that's required, how many decks are opened up. So like those photographs we saw before, we did 68% of those decks in that inspection. Um, sometimes it's 95, sometimes it could be 50% of the decks to be inspected uh, with a structural engineer. Um, in that case, we would go to the board, go to the property manager, go to the HOA and say, this is the cost to address that number of decks. So the, the number of decks might depend on what you find. If they're in pristine condition, you don't need to inspect as many, but if you find a lot of damage, then you'll be inspecting more of them. Is that it? Sure. Once we start the inspective the destructive testing, if we find that there's little to no damage, uh, that helps lead our cause as we move through the facade of the building to different decks, how we approach it. If we find questionable damage and waterproofing issues, we will be more aggressive and our destructive testing. And that's why it's important for us to see this as a two-step project and keep the board informed, the property manager in the loop so people can understand how this is evolving from a cost factor. Okay. All right, so on uh, then one of the things that's required under SB 326 is that uh, the company doing the inspection must pre prepare uh, an inspection report. And in that report, identify the building components, the physical condition of those components, uh, and then what is the expected future performance and useful life 
of those components and then make recommendations for repair and replacement. And uh, this is something that you'd want to be doing in conjunction with the reserve analyst as well, because this is going to impact the reserve study. And if the, um, according to the statute, if you find in, um, an immediate threat to health or safety, then the report has to be given to the association immediately. They have to uh, report to the local code enforcement within 15 days. So that would be what likely the building department, Robert? Is that it? Yes. Yeah. The okay. building department would be the most likely uh, agency. Okay. Correct. And then take corrective action. So the board would have to authorize taking of the corrective action. And this is where financing and reserves come into play. And this is where Sean is going to be uh, now talking about estimated costs. Yes, yeah, so this is going to have an impact on everyone's reserves. And you can see here uh, the cost estimates for uh, normal sort of testing here, which includes dest destructive testing, is about 500 to 900 per deck. Uh, this will vary property to property, and on top of this, there are some professional service fees to account for. Um, so you can see that the cost to inspect just one to two decks is more expensive than most reserve study updates. So this is why uh, your reserve specialist isn't opening up walls. Uh, you, you don't want to make reserve studies um, too expensive to conduct. And so uh, the impact on reserves um, you know, is significant. And the, the next question is, how do you account for it? And so, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the question is, can these inspections be funded for on your reserve study? And uh, the process that your reserve study provider goes through is called a four-part test. And this is established by National Reserve Study Standards. Uh, for any item to be, any project to be included on your reserve study, it has to be association responsibility, uh, which, you know, structural load bearing components are always uh, association responsibility. Uh, it has to have a limited useful life expectancy. Uh, these inspections are required every nine years. So that is set in stone. Uh, it, has to, it has to have a predictable useful life expectancy. Uh, the first round of inspections is due by January 1st, 2025. And it has to have a minimum threshold cost of a half a percent of your annual budget. And so uh, clearly the cost of these inspections would meet that criteria. And so yes, inspections should be added to your reserve study. They pass the four part test with flying colors. Okay, and so to emphasize again what you just said, these need to be completed, the first round of testing by January 1, 2025, and then in nine year increments. Now, the, the nine-year increments, um, it, can those be somehow coordinated with the reserve studies? Yes, and especially if you only conduct reserve studies every three years to meet that site inspection requirement, uh, you want to coordinate these two inspections together to make sure it gets accounted for on your reserve study. Uh, it is a good idea to have annual updates and start funding now. Uh, another consideration as well is going to be the 2024 demand crunch. Uh, we recommend to our clients that you start sooner rather than later. Uh, aim for 2021 or 22 or 23. Get ahead of the demand crunch um, for possible, you know, uh, to avoid possible price increases. Uh, to also set yourself up on a future nine year cycle where you avoid these demand crunches. And lastly, if there really is a problem with your balcony decks, it's, it's much better to find it sooner rather, rather than three years from now. Uh, it'll only be cheaper if you discover it sooner. So yes, January, January 1st, 2025 is the deadline, deadline, but the sooner the better. Okay, so we can build the inspection costs into the reserve study. Then there's going to be the problem of if they find, as Robert had discovered with one, uh, significant damage to elevated structures. And then the question then becomes, how do you pay for it? Because this is an unexpected expense. And uh, if you, the association is less than 10 years old, I think Robert, you had pointed out, uh, or Sean, that you might be able to then go against the developer uh, 
because there's that 10 year statute of limitations, actually a statute of repose, uh, that, that you are cut off after 10 years from being able to go after the developer if it has to be, if the damage is due to construction defects. Uh, the other things that you're looking at then, once you get past that 10 year statute, is you're, you'll probably have to do a special assessment in order to repair the damage. And it might be that the assessment is small enough, you don't need to get a loan. If it's quite large, then you'd be, you will probably be looking at going to a bank to get a loan. And then, uh, Sean, another question that comes up, can they actually borrow from reserves? Yes, indeed. And especially if it's an immediate safety threat, uh, the priority is safety and, and getting it addressed immediately as the law lays out. Uh, so you can borrow from reserves with the understanding that you will need to repay it within 12 months. But uh, the, the beauty of that option is it, it buys you time to figure out the, uh, uh, the repayment rather than letting a safety issue linger. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, Sean, tell us about this one. So here's, here's an example of what the potential impacts will be by adding these inspections to your reserve study. Uh, this was a 71 unit uh, condo association with a $62,500 inspection estimate. Before these inspections were added to the reserve study, they were 73.8% funded. Being above 70% funded indicates that you have strong reserves. Um, the recommended monthly reserve contribution was $3,950. So by adding this uh, one inspection line item to the reserve study, the percent funded decreased down to 65.9% funded, and the recommended monthly reserve contribution uh, bumped up to $4,500. This comes out to a $7.75 per unit increase. Um, you know, keep in mind that this is based on the tighter remaining useful life window of uh, you know, a 2024 target. In future years, you'll have all nine years to, to spread out the cost and, and fund accordingly. But do inspect um, you know, a, a significant bump to your reserve contribution in the near term due to this uh, um, one line item exclus exclusively. And it's, unfortunately, in some situations, we've had to recommend special assessments up front to uh, hope to address it. And that's just to do the inspection? Correct, yeah. We, we don't know what's underneath the stucco, uh, what pitfalls um, you know, will be discovered. And so keep that in mind, this is only for the inspections. Okay, Sean, what about this one? So one of the benefits of this law, uh, other than you know, safety, is uh, these reports, these inspections and these reports can be used to sharpen your reserve study assumptions. So uh, you know, keep your reserve study provider in the loop. Uh, we should be part of the team. And so when you obtain inspection estimates, share those with your uh, reserve specialists and you know, we'll be crafting a funding plan in accordance, uh, so you know you should be able to complete these inspections on time without delay. And then when you do receive the inspector's report, um, a critical component of that will be the expected performance and remaining useful life of the load-bearing system. So there may be additional uh, load-bearing components now that we can add to reserve studies, which usually were excluded in years past because you know we had no way to evaluate the conditions of those uh, of, of that type of infrastructure, so uh, definitely add uh, those line items to your reserve study. Start funding sooner uh, because these inspection reports uh, are going to greatly enhance your reserve study and uh, will enable them to be a wise investment. Okay, let's uh, do a summary here, and that is, as Sean pointed out, you don't want to wait until. Uh, 2024, uh, it's due uh, the report by January 1 in 2025. So that means you've got between now and the end of 2024 to get this done. And uh, as they pointed out, you want to do it sooner because it will be less expensive to make repairs now if you discover they need to be made than doing them three years from now. And you want to follow the, uh, the decking waterproofing schedule. This is probably one of the bigger elements. I'm sure Sean would agree. Uh, that gets neglected and it's the one thing that is going to keep your costs down. 
because you want to keep the moisture out of those structural members. Uh, inquire about soffit vents to reduce future inspection costs. This is something, Robert, that you talked about. And putting in those soffit vents is important for uh, getting air into there and, uh, and for future inspections. So it's less expensive to go in at a later date and inspect again. And then start your reserve funding now so that you've got the monies set aside for doing these inspections. And then uh, once the inspections are done, you can look at perhaps these are repairs that you can plan at a future date or if it's immediate, then you'll need to do them now. So uh, boards of directors and managers, what you'll want to do is work with your reserve analysts uh, as with Sean's company and making sure that you're building these things in your reserves and then with an inspection company such as Roberts uh, where you can line them up in advance to get these um, inspections started. Because as Sean pointed out, there's going to be a crunch and it's going to be difficult to get people in there to do these inspections. So you're really better off getting them started now, contacting uh, you, the companies that's going to do the inspection and start the process. Because um, uh, Robert, how long does it take to go through and do these kinds of inspections typically? The process that takes place is, can be very efficient. Uh, it does come down to making sure that the board is aware of the process and has approved each of the steps. The biggest delay is the board members approving the process and approving the services necessary to get it done. Uh, so it can take us uh, within a week to two weeks to mobilize on the initial idea of a deck inspection um, and have that first step done. Uh, but it can take board members one, two, sometimes three months to determine if they want to proceed with the next step because they have to determine and talk internally about it. Um, so uh, if the board approved everything, we could do the first step within two weeks and we could have the second step and the inspections done, uh, depending on the size of the property, uh, within three weeks thereafter. So, you know, within eight, eight weeks, we could be completely out of, uh, completely done with the service. Okay, thank you. All right, everyone, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your attending and watching this presentation. Uh, if there are questions that we can't take live, then just submit them to Netta and she'll get them to uh, either Robert, Sean, or myself. Thank you very much.